Welcome to TNT Sports Talk. Today is June 28th. It's Thursday. My name is Truman Karczewski. Travis is not here today. I'm going to be your host. I'm alone in the studio. This is my first time ever being alone in the studio, so that's interesting. But today is another great, interesting show. We have long snapper of the Packers, Zach Triner, on. Later, we interviewed him. Absolute honor to talk to Zach. He was a great guy. Great Great interview, great to talk to someone with a different perspective. Um, you know, he's got such a cool job if you think about it, and it's tough. And he was able to take us into, you know, the life of a long snapper in the NFL. Once again, it was an absolute honor to talk to Zach. I'll say that a lot more because it's an absolute dream of me and Travis's to, uh, you know, talk to a Green Bay Packer and talk to another player that uh, plays for our dream team. But a couple updates before I get into the show. You know, me and Travis are going to be on vacation next week in the Upper Peninsula. We won't have very much connection, so we will not be, uh, you know, airing TNT next week. I know that's sad, but no shows next week. But the week after that, we'll get into it. We'll have some great shows, hopefully some more cool interviews, um, diving into the free agency of the NBA, which is by then taken off. So we'll start right there. NBA free agency. Everyone's hearing about it. Everyone's talking about it. Uh, Kawhi Leonard, what's he going to do? Uh, where is he going? What are the Spurs going to do with him? That's really, it comes down to what the Spurs want to do. Listen, the Spurs, they have the best front office in the NBA and maybe in sports. They have the smartest people there. Um, Greg Popovich, he's you know the best coach in the NBA. He's not going to let them do much anything stupid he's not going to do anything stupid so the spurs are really going to cater to the, i mean the teams that want Kawhi leonard are going to cater to the spurs so if you look at the lakers that's the team that everyone kind of rumors Kawhi leonard wants to go to that's the team everyone thinks is going to get Kawhi leonard let's look at what they have brandon ingram one of my favorite players one of the best young players in the league i think the spurs are going to command him I don't think the Lakers want to give him up, but the Spurs are going to want to give want him. And um, I think they're going to command another young talent, um, possibly Kuzma, possibly Ball, um, but we'll see. You know, another they're going to command some draft picks. I guarantee it. Uh, so I think the Spurs they're going to be smart about this. They're not going to give him up for very little. They're going to want a lot, and they're sitting back there and. The teams that want Kawhi Leonard, they're begging at the Spurs' feet right now. And I think Greg Popovich is just laughing. Why would Greg Popovich in that front office want to create a super team in Los Angeles when they're in the same conference? So he's waiting. He's waiting for Los Angeles to give him the entire kitchen sink. And we're going to see what happens. As far as Paul George goes, Paul George opted out of his last year in Oklahoma City last night. Which is interesting, but people kind of expected that to happen. There's still a very good possibility that he stays in Oklahoma City on a new contract. But there's also a big, big possibility that he goes to Los Angeles. Paul George has been rumored to the Lakers for many, many years. Um, and this is the year that everyone thinks he's going to do it. And if everyone thinks he's going to join with LeBron, who we'll get into here in a second. I thought him opting out, uh, when I saw that come across my phone, I was like, oh, he's going to Los Angeles, so is LeBron. But just wait a minute. He's he's very seems to be the type of guy that doesn't want to make anyone disappointed. And I wouldn't be surprised if he stays in Oklahoma City on a new contract. I think he's going to weigh his options. I think he's going to look at Los Angeles. I think he might look at other teams like uh, the Boston Celtics, maybe the Sixers, maybe Cleveland, who knows. And I think he's going to weigh his options all at the end and pick the best choice for him and his family. But it just seems like he's not the type of guy who wants to make people mad. But he's born in Los Angeles. He's or not born in Los Angeles. He's born in California, born around Los Angeles. That's his hometown. And I think he's the most interesting free agent because Kawhi Leonard really doesn't get a choice of where he wants to go because that really comes down to Greg Popovich being stingy and that front office being stingy. If Paul George goes to Los Angeles... LeBron's going to follow him. If Paul George stays in Oklahoma City, it makes LeBron's decision a lot harder. If Paul George goes somewhere else, it's going to make LeBron's decision a lot harder. So I think Paul George is the guy to watch. 
And I really do think, no matter what people say, it is for LeBron having a super team or bust. Um, so we'll get into LeBron. I think LeBron is, I still am going to stand by my prediction that he's going to Los Angeles. I said that well, when the Cavs lost the finals. I think he's going to be a Laker next year. I do think the Lakers get Paul George as well. So I think that's what LeBron's going to go for. I'm still very undecided on what the Spurs are going to do with Kawhi. But if the Lakers get Paul George and LeBron, and they have Brandon Ingram, they have Lonzo Ball, they have Kyle Kuzma, possibly have Julius Randle, the Lakers will still have a very, very good team and could create get another superstar next summer even. So we'll see. Uh, if the Lakers get Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, I think LeBron is right there. I think it's a done deal. They're pretty much signed on the dotted line. But I do think anyway he's going to go there because I do think they will get some talent and some free agents. So that makes LeBron's decision pretty easy if one of those superstars go there. As far as Cleveland goes, they really don't have much leverage here. They don't have much to say, you need to stay because we have this. They don't really have that. Yeah, Sexton was a good pick in the draft, and I'm sure LeBron liked that. I'm sure LeBron likes Sexton, but that's it. They don't have much out that outside of that. They have an aging Kevin Love. They have horrible contracts with Tristan Thompson and uh, J.R. Smith, who's those two players are very inconsistent and not that good. Um, you know, they got a few other players that were supposed to be very good and they weren't. LeBron already played with these guys. He already saw that he can't beat the Warriors with these guys. The Celtics are only getting better. The Bucks are only getting better. The Sixers are only getting better. How am I even going to win the East with these with these whack jobs? So I think LeBron's really going to look at that. And then he's going to look at his options out West. Yeah, he's going to have to face tougher teams. He's going to have to face the Warriors more. He's going to have to face the Rockets more. He's going to have to face, you know, the Pelicans more. Blazers more. But he'll be paired with possibly another superstar, possibly two superstars, and some young talent. Guys that he hasn't tried yet with. You know, in Cleveland, he tried with these guys. He saw that he's getting swept by the Warriors. People were pretty undisputed that they were going to lose to Boston if Boston had Kyrie and Gordon Hayward. Boston's going to have those two players next year. Like I said, Sixers are going to get better. Bucks are going to get better. So I think LeBron's really got to weigh his options, and I think he's going to end up um, in Los Angeles, which is just going to make that conference even crazier. Uh, but... That's what it all comes down to. I think Paul George, like I said, is the most interesting one to watch. Because uh, I think if he stays in Oklahoma City, it's not that much of a done deal that LeBron's going to Los Angeles. But if LeBron, if Paul George calls to Los Angeles, LeBron will probably likely follow him. But it came, also came out earlier this morning that I thought was kind of funny that LeBron texted Kevin Durant and told him to join up with him in Los Angeles. I can tell you right now, I have no insight, no insiders, no one to talk to. But Kevin Durant and LeBron did not text each other about Los Angeles. LeBron didn't text out text KD. That's just all speculation. That's all rumors. We've seen rumors, rumors, rumors all all the time. Likely not true. Um, Kevin Durant, don't worry. He's staying in Golden State. He's not going to risk his legacy there um, like he did with uh, the Thunder. But I just thought that was kind of funny to throw in there. But Kevin Durant and LeBron are not pairing on the Lakers. But uh, that's going to be it for basketball. Like I said, we're not going to be on the show next week. That is going to be the hot week for this. So the week after, we will just dive into it and what's gonna ha- what happened, really. So just sit back, watch. LeBron's got until, I think, Friday at midnight to make his decision on the opt-out, opt-in with the Cavs. Um, he'll likely opt out either way, no matter his decision. But just keep that, watch that, and we'll dive into it in a week. But this is the most interesting time of the year when it comes to basketball, in my opinion, because free agency in basketball is so interesting. Next, I'm going to go into baseball. Um, like I said, as far as basketball, you know, there's a lot to talk about because free agency and LeBron, LeBron watch. With baseball, not much is going on at all. These are the absolute dog days of the summer. You have teams that are hot, teams that are not hot. You have deadline coming up, which is interesting, but not much is going on. Uh, you play, you win. You know the games are happening, but not much interesting is going on. 
So I just want to touch quick, though, on baseball regarding Jacob deGrom. Um, I think as far as the deadline comes up, I think he's the most interesting player to watch. Um, listen, he's one of the best pitchers in the league. Some people may argue that he is the best pitcher in the league. The Mets aren't that good of a team. Teams at the deadline are really going to ask for Jacob deGrom. They're going to call the Mets about Jacob deGrom. The Mets are going to absolutely drive up the price. Um, it's like the Kawhi Leonard, like the NBA. The Mets aren't going to be dumb about this. They're going to ask for the best prospects you have and maybe even more. And so it's, I was just thinking in the car today about some teams for Jacob deGrom. Okay, obviously, the first team I thought about was the Brewers. Yeah, that would be nice. Uh, the Brewers need a front-line ace. Uh, they're the, they have the best record in the NL right now. If not the best, I, I couldn't update you on the standings right now. But they have always needed that front-line ace. Obviously, DeGrom would do that. The Brewers have a talented farm system. They've got some talented young players uh, that they could offer up. But that's another one. I don't know if the Brewers would do that. Um, that's a lot to. That's a lot of young talent going out the door for a pitcher. But it is a pitcher that the Brewers need. And one thing interesting about DeGrom, and this is for all teams that would love him, he's got so you got him under control for the rest of this season, obviously. You will have him under control for next season, and you will have him under control for the season after that. You don't get that for a lot of players. Uh, and that's why I think the Mets might keep him. But another team, uh, the Yankees, they're going to be buyers at the deadline. They are one of the best teams in the league. I think they're undisputed in the top three there with the Red Sox and Astros. And the one thing holding the Yankees back right now is that starting rotation. Uh, it's, it's a weak, you know, it's a good starting rotation, but it's, you know, it's not as strong as the Yankees would like it to be because it's the Yankees, and they're always going to be looking to get better. So I think the Yankees could go after DeGrom. Uh, I think they have talent. They have, the, they have the price to give, and he would easily push the Yankees over the top. But do the Yankees want to give up that much and that much young young prospect, young talent for to get DeGrom in one pitcher in a division where the Red Sox might be the best team in the league and a conference where the Astros might be the best team in the league by far? Do you want to give up that much and risk uh, you know, having to face teams that are might be better than you? You know, the AL is such an interesting conference because they've got so many good teams. So do you want to give up that much for having to face this conference? But the Yankees are one of those best teams. Um, you know, they should be buyers and they should try to, you know, at the deadline they should try to get to Grom or something else to improve that rotation and push them over the Red Sox and the Astros, which is going to be tough to do. And DeGrom would do that, though. Next up, I have the Cleveland Indians on my list for DeGrom. Cleveland, this is interesting because Cleveland has by far the best rotation in baseball. I said it. Not They have one of the best rotations in baseball. I hate talking them up. But with DeGrom, they would have... The best rotation in baseball by far. Um, I don't like saying that, but you know it's not that big of a need because they do have Kluber, they do have Bauer, they do have Carrasco. But if you got Degrom, you would have the biggest strength, I think, um, out of all the teams that are competing for the for in the AL. You'd have the best rotation, and you have very good hitters and a very good lineup. But that's another one. Do the think? Do you think the Indians can compete? Do the Indians think they can compete with the Astros, Yankees, Red Sox with just adding Degrom? I don't know. Uh, that's the Indians have to look at that long and hard. Uh, they should be buyers at the deadline. They have a lot of good prospects. They possibly. They, I think they have the best out of the three teams I just said. They have the best offer to give the Mets. Um, but that's just an interesting thing I was, I was thinking about in the car today. I don't know if that's they would even consider it. But another news coming out of baseball is uh, Otani. Uh, he got cleared to swing today. Um, it's interesting because Otani was uh, supposed to be out until freaking 2020 or something. Um, so that's huge for the Angels that someone cleared him to swing and doctor cleared him to swing. 
you know, he's one of the most bright young talents in baseball. The fact that he can pitch, hit, you know, we talked about him a lot on the show earlier um, in the baseball season. But that's huge for the Angels. So it doesn't it doesn't look like he'd be out until 2020. Um, he still could be out for a while, but that's big for the Angels, and that's news that just came out. Um, sticking with the Angels, um, I want to touch on another interesting story in Mike Trout. Uh, Mike Trout is on an absolute tear this year, and um, I was talking about it with Johnny. He's been on the show before, and Mike Trout gets talked about not much at all. He is like the LeBron of baseball because he could win MVP every single year. He's so consistent, hit after hit after hit. He's putting up crazy numbers, and no one talks about him. People like to talk about Harper. They like to talk about other players. They don't like to talk about Mike Trout. I don't know why. If he can keeps this up consistently, he will be the best player of all time. And I just wanted to throw this in there for some reason, but I don't know. I just feel as if Mike Trout should be talked about more. I feel like he should be loved more because right now he's putting up ridiculous numbers and people need to look at him and say that he could possibly be the GOAT of baseball when it's all said and done um, after the numbers he is putting up right now. Next, we're going to move on to football. um, where I'm going to move on to football. Uh, But first, I'm going to say this. The TNT is brought to you. TNT Sports Talk is brought to you by D's Home Cuts. Um... These home cuts has been giving me and Travis the freshest, best haircuts uh, for about six months now. And most of the guests that come on the show have been getting fresh cuts by D's um, for a very cheap and low price at $7. You can go into um, the shop and get a very professional, great looking haircut. You can play Madden, Fortnite, and have an awesome talk with Dom about sports or whatever. You know, Dom, like I said, $7. Definitely tip the man, though, but he gives you an amazing haircut. You can go to his Instagram, uh, D's Home Cuts, and look at the fresh cuts he gives. Set up an appointment. Get in the shop right now if you want to look fresh and as best as you ever had before. Just go on his Instagram, look at all the cuts he's given, then set up an appointment and um, enjoy your experience in the shop at D's Home Cuts. So next we're going to move on to football. Um... First, I wanted to touch on Jameis Winston. Not much is going on in football. Again, this is the dog days of the summer for football, that gap in between OTAs and training camp. Um, so not much is going on, not much to talk about. But Jameis Winston is officially suspended for three games. Uh, that's huge. Uh, but, you know, it's better than it was rumored to be at six games, and Jameis Winston lowered them to three so that's a huge. That's a win for the Buccaneers that it wasn't six games. It's only three, but like I said in the other show, this hurts the Buccaneers a lot. This was supposed to be the year where Jameis Winston take the next step forward, and he's not going to get to do that for three games. Um, he's going to have to sit and watch Ryan Fitzpatrick take the helm of the Buccaneers, and he's not going to be able to prove that last year was kind of a fluke. And he is going to be one of the elite quarterbacks and best young quarterbacks in the game. Uh, let's see, make it or break it year for the Buccaneers. Dirk Cutter, the head coach, a guy that I've always um, liked, but I've always found it interesting that the Buccaneers had a good season. I forget their record, but with a rookie quarterback, they had a very good season. They might have been nine and seven or something, better than what they expected, and they fired their head coach, Lovey Smith. That's because uh, offense coordinator Dirk Cutter was taking interviews other places he was possibly going to be a head coach somewhere else but the Buccaneers fired Levy Smith so they could keep Dirk Cutter so they can keep Jameis Winston in that same offensive system now flashback a couple years the Buccaneers had a huge step back last season they were supposed to be in the playoffs they're supposed to be one of the best teams in the league you know they had talent on the outside Deshaun Jackson Mike Evans OJ Howard Jameis Winston had it all set up for him and they took a very big step back so this is a make it break year for Dirk Cutter and the Buccaneers and Jameis Winston. So I would very much – I think they're one of the best storylines to follow this year because if they don't take a step forward, things might start to blow up in Tampa Bay because I think Dirk Cutter is on the hot seat. Um, Jameis Winston is not on the hot seat, but if Dirk Cutter is on the hot seat and he gets fired, Jameis Winston is going to have to learn a whole other playbook and a whole other offensive system, uh, which he's had issues with in the past. 
So this is a huge year for the Buccaneers. I think for the first three games, they'll be okay with Ryan Fitzpatrick. He's a very solid backup quarterback. Um, but as far as the development of Jameis Winston, this is a very big setback. But it's a very big win that it wasn't six games. Uh, next, I'm going to move into the 32 teams in 32 days. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go today, stay in the AFC West with the Denver Broncos. Uh, the Denver Broncos, I believe, were 5-11 and last year. Not too sure, but around that record. And over the offseason, I think they got better. I think they definitely improved starting with the quarterback position. Case Keenum, listen, he's he's a very solid quarterback. What he did with Minnesota last season, yeah, might have been kind of a one-year fluke. But anything is an upgrade over Brock Osweiler, Trevor Simeon, and Paxton Lynch. And Case Keenum, he's going to come in there. He's going to give you consistency. He's going to be able to get outside the pocket, make some plays. Um, he's got weapons all over the place, I think. I love their receiving core. I love Demarius Thomas. Emmanuel Sanders is a very speedy, good receiver, consistent. And then I love the the uh, how they drafted Cortland Sutton, uh, the receiver out of SMU. Uh, I think he's going to be one of the best young receivers in the game. Uh, that was a great draft pick for them, and it's just going to help him even more. Um, as far as... The running back situation goes. It's been a question mark in Denver for many, many years. But this year, you know, they lost C.J. Anderson, but I love the draft pick when they of Royce Freeman um, out of Oregon. I think he is going to be the starting running back in Denver, and I think he's going to be a very good one. I think he's going to be able to take the pressure off of Case Keenum, and I think he's going to be able to give Denver somewhat of a consistency, which they haven't had for a long time um, at running back. But offensive line, as far as that goes, that's what concerns me on the offense. Um, I love Royce Freeman, uh, but that offensive line, you know, the guards, they didn't improve, um, you know, as far as the run blocking goes. Denver's got some work to do, but I think uh, they have they have the pieces there uh, that can give them, you know, not a great offensive line, not a bad offensive line, just they can be mediocre, and I think that's what they need, need at least. But the anchor of this team by far is that defense still. Um, when they won Super Bowl 50, it was their defense. Uh, but Von Miller and first-round draft pick Bradley Chubb on the outside rushing the passer is the scariest tandem in the league. Teams are going to have to – they're going to have to uh, double-team Von Miller on one side. And really, they're not going to want to leave Bradley Chubb on the outside one-on-one, but they're going to have to. Um, it's really pick your poison, and teams are not going to want to do that, and that's the strength of this team right now. Denver is very scary um, uh, as far as passing, rush, pa- rushing the passer. Um, in the secondary, Chris Harris. Chris Harris Jr. is one of the most underrated players in the league. I think he's one of the best corners in the league, and he gets doesn't get any love. Um, I don't know if it was overshadowed because Aqib Talib was there, but Chris Harris is a very, very good player. Very good corner, and people don't talk about him enough. And I think he's one of the strengths of that defense and the anchor next to Von Miller on that defense. As far as losing a keep to lead, yeah, that's kind of a big loss. You know, he's a very good corner, but Bradley Roby can take the reins. I think he's a very, very consistent, and he's shown bright spots of being a very good corner in this league. And I think that he can replace him very good. So I don't think that's as big as, you know, a hole as some people have said. So I still like their secondary. I still love their pass rushing, and I think their defense is the anchor of this team. But I still think this team goes as far as Case Keenum takes them. I think if Case Keenum can be consistent, keep the ball, don't turn it over, Denver can be a very, very good team. They can be a scrappy team. I'm going to go with the record prediction of 8-8. Eight and eight. Um, I think that it's an improvement of a year. Um, but I just, I'm concerned about, uh, you know, if Case Keenum, I, I think people who love Case Keenum overrate him and I think there's people who underrate him, but I think that this is, that's where this team is at. They're a young, they're going to be a young team. Um, so I'm going to go with eight and eight. It's a tough division. They have a tough schedule. Uh, but I love what they're doing. I love Vance Joseph, their head coach. I don't think he should be on the hot seat. Like some people are saying, and I think Denver's going to be a very scrappy, underrated team next year. 
Uh, but I'm going to stick with eight and eight. Uh, but they're a team to watch out for. Uh, next, I'm going to move into our question and answer. Uh, but first, I'm going to. Our show is brought to you by A's Lawn Service. Uh, Andrew um, has been giving great lawn care, cheap lawn care around Northeast Ohio for a couple years now. Um, him and his crew do an amazing job. Uh, you don't want to get dragged around by these lawn, these big lawn and landscaping companies, and get. Then they just rip your pocket out and just you have to pay check after check after check. Andrew doesn't do that. He gives you an amazing price um, and he gives you the best job you can possibly ask for. Uh, go to his Twitter at A's Lawn Service. Uh, get his number and all his contact information. Um, Andrew does an amazing job. Um, he's a great kid, great crew. Definitely give Andrew a call if you want the best landscaping care in Northeast Ohio. Uh, next, I'm going to have our question and answer. Um I only have one today. I was sent in. Who's an underrated, the underrated uh, NBA um, free agent? Really, you can pick any name that's not Kawhi Leonard. Well, I mean, that's not Paul George, LeBron, or the Kawhi Leonard news. Because that seems to be the only thing people are talking about nowadays. So I'm going to go to Julius Randle, first of all. Uh, I think Julius Randle is a very, very talented young player. I think he took a very big step forward for the Lakers last season. Um, and I think he, the Lakers, if they get Paul George, LeBron, possibly Kawhi Leonard, they're not going to be able to keep um, Julius Randle. Uh, so I think he could go somewhere. Dallas is a possibility. Um, you know, if DeMarcus Cousins leaves uh, New Orleans, New Orleans could be a possibility. Um just any team that needs a big man, a young, he's a young, talented player that took a very big step forward. He's got a lot of potential. So I think Julius Randle is a player to watch for. Another one's DeAndre Jordan with the Clippers. Everyone's saying that the favorite for him is the Mavericks, uh, which is very interesting to me because the Mavericks were the team, you know, where he had the, where he was supposed, was supposedly signed and committed to the Mavericks, and then he backed out, um, and everyone was pissed at him. Mark Ewan was pissed at him, and all that, blah 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 blah. And now it's rumored that he's going to sign there. Um, but I think it's he's another one. He's a very good rim protector. You know, big men aren't as coveted in the league anymore. But I think uh, DeAndre Jordan would be a very good signing for any team. Uh, maybe he's another a player LeBron would join up with. Maybe he would stay in Los Angeles and go to the Lakers. I don't know. Uh, but he's another interesting one to watch. Uh, but if you're talking about NBA free agency... Like I said, Paul George is the one to watch, uh, but underrated. I love Julius Randle. Um, I think he's flying under the radar right now. Um, but next, we're going to move into our interview with Packers long snapper Zach Triner. Um, again, I'm going to say this over and over again. Absolute honor to talk to him. He's a great guy. Uh, he went into you know kind of what the long snapper position means. Um, I think it's a very underrated position in the league. Um, they don't get talked about at all. And I think Zach was an amazing person. I'm rooting for him. You know, he's in a, in a competition for a long snapping job in Green Bay um, with Hunter Bradley, uh, sixth round, I believe, draft pick. So he kind of gave some insight in competitions and training camp and all that. So it was an absolute great time talking to Zach. Uh, he was awesome to me and Travis. And I had, once again, absolute honor to talk to him. So here we are, interview with Packers long snapper Zach Triner. Zach Triner. Uh, we'll start there. What's it like to be introduced as a Green Bay Packer? Uh, it's actually it's an, an absolute honor because I'll, I'll tell you what, I grew up a Patriots fan and just an overall NFL fan, mm-hmm. and I went to one away game in my whole life, and it was probably when I was in seventh grade or so, seventh or eighth grade, and it was at Lambeau. So oh. at Lambeau, when Brett Favre was still slinging it around That's and awesome. they were playing the Patriots, so we went out to Lambeau, and then when we came, you know, obviously had OTAs and stuff, but took a step onto that practice field and just kind of soaked it in because I remember being on the other side of that not too long ago. Yeah, so we're the, we're going to get into, like, the teams here who were interested in you. So were the Packers the only team that was interested in bringing you on the roster? So the Packers is actually my so my third team. So I, my first team was the Texans. They brought me in, uh, gave me my first shot. Mm-hmm. For the rookie mini camp, and then last year I was with the Jets for the the off season program, and then the the Packers this year for I signed last year like the uh, Detroit week. Mm-hmm. So um, 
How's your relationship with the special teams coordinator, Ron Zuck? Uh, Ron's an awesome guy. He's been – he's probably, I'd say, one of the most decorated and tenured in the league. He's coached mm-hmm. at Illinois. He's coached at Florida. He's coached probably every position under the sun. So when it comes to having some guy that needs to know every position and who can fill in where, um, you know, he's he's one of the best. And he's – you know, he has his hands filled, obviously, with J.K. being a rookie and, you know, myself or Hunter also being a rookie. So, mm-hmm. you know, you'd want exactly that type of guy and that type of experience to lead that way. So, he's, you know, he's the man for the job. He's a good guy. Yeah, so you played defensive line in college. Um, can you tell us how that helps with the snapping and the punt coverage nowadays? Absolutely, yeah. I think that's, um, you know, one of the things that separates me from the other snappers. Uh, if you look at a lot of the teams now, I'm trying to think, like the guys that are stuck around, you look at guys like Mike Leach, played tight end at William & Mary. You look at John Denny for Miami. I think he went to BYU, if I'm not mistaken, and he played the end, their tight end as well. Uh, Luke Rhodes from the Colts, you know, he was a linebacker for pretty much his whole career and just picked up snapping. So, you know, if there's any advice to give to the younger guys, it's just, you know, be able to – be an athlete, play as many positions as you can, and just kind of step in and mm-hmm. you know, be able to fill whatever spot the coach asked of you. So it's definitely been a huge asset for me. Do you think, you know, being a long snapper, do you think that position is kind of, you know, that job is kind of disrespected by, like, fans who really don't know much about the NFL? Um, yeah, you know, I think it's one of those positions that it just doesn't get too much coverage, so you don't know exactly what's going on under the helmet of those players. So if you look at it, I tell all the guys that I help out back home, it's not necessarily a talent position. It's a pressure position, just like the kicker. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we we do the same thing over and over. It's like golf. So once you get that swing down, like, you can do it. There's plenty of snappers out there that can snap in their backyard, you know, 100 out of 100 times. Mm-hmm. So how long did it take you to get, you know, that swing down, you know, that, that motion figured out? Uh, I think it's, you know, right now it's, I snapped in high school, I snapped in college, and obviously I'm snapping now. It's just mm-hmm. one of those things that you always kind of constantly critique. And you mm-hmm. try to look for, you know, the small thing here, small thing there that can, you know, make it a little bit better. So mm-hmm. do I have it down? I'd like to think so based on, you know, the level that I'm at. But, you know, that said, once you have that mindset, you kind of, you kind of, you know, beat yourself. So I'm always looking to critique something and improve somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what would you say is the hardest part about being a long snapper? The hardest part? I think, honestly, for me, it's, you know, I come from assumption where I played the end. So I played defense. I even played, like, a little bit of goal line offense. So it's kind of, you know, taking a step back and not playing, you know, 30 or 40 plays a game and only going to, you know, whether it be six to ten plays a game. And it's not necessarily – the same. So the 40 plays, you know, if you get beat on one of those plays on a first down and they get three yards, it's not a big deal. But the eight or ten plays that you have as a long snapper, every single rep has to be perfect or else you're not going to be the guy. So I think that's the biggest difference. So you mentioned it a little bit. Uh, you said you started to snap in high school? Yep. Why did you start to, you know, long snap? Is this something you wanted to get on the field more or is that, you know, you knew you had a talent for it? Yeah, no, I was a I was a sophomore in high school, and we were at a summer camp, and I remember this to this very day. Coach Reardon, um, back in Marshall High School, had asked me, you know, um, hey, you're a sophomore, you're gonna you know gonna be a good athlete here, you're gonna start for us the next couple of years, but as a sophomore, you know, you're fighting for for playing time against the juniors and the seniors, so mm-hmm. if you're looking to get on the field a little bit earlier, you know, try this out, and I was like, yeah, that. <laughs> That sounds like a pretty good pretty good option to me, so I tried yeah. it out and ended up having a, a knack for it. Uh, so when you started to, you know, get more into long snapping, you know, in college and, like you said, high school, was there any guys, like, in the NFL that you looked up to, watched tape on to try to get better at your craft? Um, yeah, actually, so I was fortunate enough to reach out to Sean Morey. So he's not a snapper, but he's a he was a special teams captain for – couple Super Bowl teams, and he's from my hometown. Okay. And he was friends with Mike Leach, um, and he was friendly with Zach Diossi as well because they both went to Brown together. 
Yeah. Um, so I was really, really fortunate to, you know, be able to, when I was coming out, just bounce, you know, a couple of ideas off of Zach or a couple of ideas off of Mike. And, you know, they, I can't thank them enough for, you know, being awesome guys and helping me out. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an interesting question. It's kind of, kind of a funny one. You know, people talk about Tom Brady versus Aaron Rodgers, but who would you say is the greatest long snapper of all time? The greatest long snapper. I mean, you, you probably have to give it to either Pat Manley or Mike Leach, just uh-huh. based on tenure, I think. Because if you look at – I worked with um, Pat, and then I've, I've talked with Mike. But I think both of those guys, if you were to look at the best of all time, that, that aren't playing anymore, mm-hmm. you probably have to look at those two guys. I think it was, what, 16 and 17 years to be able to do it at that high of a level. I think and I think Pat Manley was the first guy to count all the rotations and figure out the laces and things like that. So maybe I'll give the edge to to Pat and hope that you know Mike's not listening. <laughs> uh, so long snapping, you said it's, it's a stroke. Uh, do you kind of have to establish a rhythm, you know, with the kicker and punter? Does that help? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's important to you know with Mason. Honestly, Mason's not going to miss a kick if. You know, we we as the snapper and the holder take care of our jobs. Mm-hmm. If we make sure that you know it's in the same spot and the laces are good, you know he's he's been around for that long for a reason. And mm-hmm. as long as he doesn't have to think about that, you know he's gonna have a a really good rest of the career with with Green Bay. So same thing with the punter. As long as they're comfortable catching the ball and they don't have to think about us, which they shouldn't have to, you know he should be putting up the the five five fifties. So, so absolutely. You- you think you've established a pretty good rhythm with J.K. Scott and Mason so far in OTAs? Well, I think there's there's always work to be done for sure, but I think, you know, we're in a, a really good spot. Um, you know, whether it's J.K. Um, or it's Mason, um, I think, like I said, there's definitely room for improvement, but I, uh, I do think we're in a, a pretty good spot. Yeah, so um, training camp's coming up in about a month or so now. Um, so how are you getting prepared for your first NFL training camp? Uh, so I'm actually going to San Diego. Um, John Carney, who kicked in the league for 23 years, he has a gym out in Carlsbad. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like the specialist mecca, if you will. So I went out there for the off season, and there's guys uh, like Drew Ferris, who's snapping for the Bucks. Um, oh, shoot, I'm kind of blanking on Blair Wallace is out there. He's with the Vikings. So there's just so many guys out there that if you're a specialist, whether it's long snapper, punter, kicker, you know, that's where you want to be. So I'll be going out there not too, uh, not too long from now. Uh, are you staying, I know you're going into the training camp. You're going to be in a competition with Hunter Bradley, the rookie, uh, that we drafted in the sixth round. Uh, how's mm-hmm. your relationship with Hunter Bradley? Uh, it's, it's actually one of those funny things where, uh, we've become pretty good friends. So it's, you know, one of those situations where we don't have anything, you know, to do with the decision. We control what we can control and snap our best balls. And at the end of the day, it's not like it's me making the decision for Hunter and Hunter making the decision for me. It's, you know, the front office is there for a reason. We mm-hmm. brought in both of us for a reason. And, you know, the winner's going to take all. But we've actually, <laughs> surprisingly, we get the we get this question a lot. Become pretty good friends. Yeah. Yeah, so you're with the Packers right now. Um, pack, we're Packer fans here. Um, the different traditions, you know, like bike to training camp, are you looking forward to all that? You know, it's, it's one of the best organizations in sports. Um, and I was just wondering how excited you are for the Packer traditions. I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, I remember, obviously, I, I said I was a, just an NFL fan in general. So I remember, um, like the bike in the practice and all those small things. And, uh, mm-hmm. there's the Lambo, uh, excuse me, the Lombardi trophies right when you walk into the locker room. So, all of that is just a daily reminder of, you know, what you are a part of. And I would want, you know, nothing more than just, just be able to do my part and you know, making sure that that continues. So um, we're going to wrap this thing up. We ask everybody this. Who's your favorite athlete of all time? My favorite athlete of all time. I'll probably go with – so I'm a, a two-sport athlete myself, so I played Division One lacrosse at Siena. So mm-hmm. I have a respect for the two-sport athletes. So I might have to go with uh, with the Bo Jackson here. Oh, that's a good one. We haven't heard that one before. Uh, yeah. who's your, what's your favorite sports memory of all time? 
My favorite sports memory. So this is actually, it's not a playing memory. It's a, a coaching memory. So I, uh, those years where I was with the Texans and with the Jets and bobbing around, I was able to coach uh, lacrosse. So I coached yeah. eighth grade lacrosse, which was my brother's team. So all his friends that were growing up and I knew, you know, from growing up and coming over our house, we, um, as the head coach, we won the championship for the eighth grade. And I just remember, like, I obviously can't do anything on the field, but just watching all them come together and, you know, win the championship, that's probably my favorite memory. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, do you have any more questions, Sean? No, I think that's it for me. Yep. Uh, well, that's it for us. Uh, we want to thank you for coming on, and, you know, good luck in training camp. We're rooting for you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep, thanks. That's it for our interview with Zach Triner, Packers long snapper. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, once again, it was an absolute honor to talk to Zach. He was a really cool guy. It was really cool to learn about <clears throat> the position and how people don't give it as much value and, um, as it takes. And you know, it does take a lot of hard work to you know be in the NFL and go under that type of stress that long snappers do. But it was really cool to learn. Um, we hope well, once again, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope to get more interviews with not only Packers players, but players around the NFL, MLB, um, NBA, whatever it may be. You know, it's really cool to get to learn their stories and just the me and Travis growing as a podcast. So it was really cool to talk to Tim and Zach. So we hope for more of that in the future. Um, but that's it for me today. Uh, we just rate, review, subscribe to us. Um, you can look us up on YouTube. Um, listen to us on 12 ounce tomorrow from 12 to one. Uh, uh, and just, I hope you have a great, um, day, rest of the day today. Um, great rest of the week. And then a great week next week. Um, happy 4th of July to everyone. Again, to me and Travis will not be here next week, so we won't be doing the show next week and we'll pick it up, um, in two weeks. Uh, thank you and have a great day and go Packers.